super conquerors. That's what this last few verses of Romans chapter 8 is talking about. Romans 8, 37 through 39 is our text for today. As we complete this portion of the book of Romans, we're going to uh, uh, take a, a break from Romans, and we're going to look at the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, and then uh, at a later date, we'll return back to Romans 9 through 11, which is Paul's great treatise on predestination. And so uh, in the days ahead, if you want to, uh, to look ahead and read ahead, please read the book of Roman or the book of Jonah a number of times. And when we get towards the end of Jonah, then you can go back and uh, reread in uh, the book of, of Romans, starting in chapter 9. Back in 1937, the Great Golden Gate Bridge was completed. Some of you have probably walked across that bridge. When we lived in California, our kids loved to uh, uh, go to the parking lot on the north end of the bridge and uh, then walk out onto the bridge and see how high it was above the ocean. And uh, it's, it's quite an engineering marvel. In fact, a couple of the people in our church actually worked for the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, so it was quite a phenomenal thing. Back then it cost $37 million to build. Today it would be billions upon billions to be sure. But uh, it, it was really interesting. It, it went in two phases. There was the slow phase and there was the rapid phase of completion. The slow phase was uh, in the beginning and about halfway through, uh, there had been a number of deaths. People had fallen to uh, their death. 23 men fell to their deaths during this period of time. And so work went rather slow. People were very cautious. And at the same time, they uh, uh, were in such tremendous peril. The second phase of the bridge was when they put a safety net below the bridge. Not a single person died after the safety net was put. And at least 10 men actually fell into the net. And so the, the work that had been progressing very slowly was rapidly brought to a conclusion because of the fact that these men were assured of security. Now we have a safety net too, and it's the word of God. And no matter what, that safety net is going to keep us eternally secure. It is our safety net. And so ultimately with a safety net, we can live our lives with confidence and we can work for the kingdom. And so it's kind of an important thing that we consider that we indeed are super conquerors. It says there, in verse number 37, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. The, the word there in Greek is hupor, huper nikos. And nikos is that word that we have for Nike, which means the winner. And huper is the word super. So we are super winners in God's sight when we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We conquerors will never be separated from the safety, security, and love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Nothing can separate. So number one, verse number 37, it says super conquerors are confirmed. There is a super conquerors confirmation, but all the in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. In the movie, The Lion King, the young cub, Simba, was surrounded by hyenas. As he gets ready to defend himself, his father, 
the absolute king of the jungle, jumps up behind Simba and roars. At that great roar, the hyenas scatter away. Now, the truth is, sometimes hyenas do hang up and defeat an adult lion. But I want to tell you something. But if every created being in all of the universe were to gang up upon God, they still would not be able to defeat him. There is a complete difference in God and anything that he has created. With that kind of God for you, what can possibly be against you? Nothing, nothing can be against you. Who or what do you have to fear? No one, no thing. Now, this security that we have in Christ leads to our stability, leads to our security, and leads to our productivity. We can't be productive if we are constantly quaking and worrying about our survival. So it's important to recognize that. And, and so this, this whole passage that we've been talking about, starting verse number 28 and going all the way through the end of verse 39 of Romans chapter 8, talks about the eternal security of the believer. We have that security. Augustus Top Lady, uh, uh, an old uh, poet, tartly made the point uh, with this famous verse, if it ever should come to pass that sheep of Christ might fall away, my fickle soul, alas, would fall a thousand times a day. Aren't you glad that he holds you in the palm of his hand? You don't just hold on to his hand. He holds you safe in the palm of his hand. and He'll never, ever let you go. So super conquerors have a confirmation. And then he goes on, Paul goes on in verse 38 and the, the first part of verse number 39, talking about the super conquerors comparisons, comparisons. Look what it says in verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Nothing is going to separate us from God. In C.S. Lewis's book, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, is uh, a scene where Lucy, one of the human children, is with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And in, in that, uh, Lucy is questioning Mr. and Mrs. Beaver about the Christ figure, about the lion. And his name was Aslan. Actually, uh, Aslan is the Turkish word for lion. And Lucy asked Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Oh, that you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. If by safety we mean that we will never have problems and burdens and trials, no, God is not safe. For he will use those things to sanctify us and drive us to him. But if by safe we mean that we are secure in his love for us and that we can take refuge in him and find comfort in him, then yes, friend, he is immeasurably safe. Our salvation is secure in him. We are secure in him. We are eternally, irrevocably loved by him when we are in Christ. If you were in Christ, you were loved by Christ, secure in Christ, and safe in Christ. And so these comparisons are really for our benefit. The first one is 
not the crisis of death, nor the calamities of life can separate us from the love of God. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, there's an old country song, prop me up beside the jukebox when I die. That's a real song. Joe Diffie sings these words. Well, I ain't afraid of dying. It's the thought of being dead. I want to go on being me once my eulogy has been read. That's, that's kind of what we think, don't we? What is beyond this veil of death? Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> We're all kind of like that, aren't we? The crisis of death cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Neither life nor death can separate us from the love of Christ. In life, we live with Christ. Death, we die with him. Because we die with him, we also rise with him. Death, so far as being a separation, is only a step to his nearer presence, not the end, but it's the gate on the skyline leading to the presence of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54. But when this perishable should put on imperishable and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? So neither death nor life can separate us from the love of Christ. And number two, not the intervention of angels or the intrusion of demons. It says there, for I am convinced that neither angels nor principalities, and oftentimes in the scripture, and especially in uh, Jewish writing, uh, the principalities were uh, an indicator of demonic principalities, those fallen angels that uh, have left the service of God. And, and so neither angels nor demons can separate us from God. At this particular time in history, when Paul was writing this, and uh, because he was literally a Jewish rabbi, uh, the rabbis had a highly developed uh, theory about angels. In fact, uh, they said that everything and everyone has its angel. There were angels for the wind, the clouds, the snow, the hail, the hoarfrost, the thunder and lightning, cold heat, the seasons. The rabbi said there was nothing in the world, not even a braid, blade of grass that did not have its angel. Angels were everywhere. According to the rabbis, there were three ranks of angels. I mean, there was the good, the better, and the best. Do you remember the old Sears and Roebuck uh, tools? There was the good tools. They weren't really very good. They were the better tools. They were Dunlops. They weren't bad. But then there was craftsmen. And if you broke a craftsman, you could take it back to Sears and they'd give you a brand new one. No questions asked, ever. And so that's, uh, they had that about angels, too. This first one included thrones, cherubim, and seraphim. They were kind of the lowest uh, rank of angels. The second included powers, lordship, and mites. And the third included angels and archangels and principalities. And so they had developed this whole theory. Now, uh, more than once, Paul speaks of angels in Ephesians, Colossians, and 1 Corinthians. Now, the rabbis, and Paul had once been a rabbi, believed that they were, these angels were grudgingly hostile to men. They believed that they had been angry with God uh, when God created man because they wanted to be the chief part of creation. It was said they did not want to share God with anyone and grudged man his share in him. They had a legend that when God appeared on Sinai to give Moses the law, he was attended by a host of angels, and the angels grudged the Israel the law and assaulted Moses on his way up the mountain and would have stopped him if God had not interfered. 
This is all myth. But there was this, this feeling in those days that angels were extremely important. And you better be careful because they could be dangerous. God says, no angel, no demon will ever separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then he goes on and says, not that the cares of today, nor the concerns of tomorrow. Paul says, I am convinced that neither the things present nor the things to come. Now, today we have eschatologies that divide all of time into seven or more segments. And the Jews had a rather simple outlook on time. There was time right now, which included past history, and there was time, not yet, but was going to come. They had today and tomorrow. That's what they considered. And, and so uh, Paul is saying, nothing today and nothing tomorrow is going to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's all going to be all right. I read a prayer that uh, I think is, is very significant. I don't know who this person is. Her name is Ruth Harms Calkin, but uh, I think she sums up what I really feel about today and tomorrow. And I quote her, God, I'm, I may fall flat on my face. I may fail until I feel old and beaten and done in. Yet your love for me is changeless. All the music may go out of my life. My private world may shatter to dust. Even so, you will hold me in the palm of your steady hand. No turn in the affairs of my fractured life can baffle it. Satan, with all of his braggadocio, cannot distract you. Nothing can separate me from your measureless love. Pain can't. Disappointment can't. Anguish can't. Yesterday, today, tomorrow can't. The loss of my dearest love can't. Death can't. Life can't. Riots, wars, insanity, hunger, neurosis, disease, none of these things, nor all of them heaped together, can budge the fact that I am dearly loved, completely forgiven, and forever free through Jesus Christ, your beloved son. I love that prayer. Nothing can separate me. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing today, nothing tomorrow. And then the fourth one, not the pinnacle heaven or the pit of hell, for I'm convinced that neither height nor depth, this height or depth probably is an echo of uh, Psalm uh, 139 uh, and verse number eight, where he says, I ascended to heaven and you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. The idea of the impossibility of finding a place where God does not reach is an impossibility. There is no possibility. There is a place where God cannot reach you. Now, there's, there's another way to look at this uh, uh, little phrase. Uh, these could be astrological terms because even so, even though the Jews said we don't, we don't bank in any astrology or anything, uh, this was prevalent in those days. The ancient world was haunted by the tyranny of the stars. Na National Geographic this last month had another article on Stonehenge. I think they ought to rename National Geographic the Stonehenge Manual, because every, every two or three months, there seems to be an article on it. And this was, had to do with the stars and, and the, the vernal equinox, whenever all of the things came into alignment. And uh, uh, this was, was so prevalent in ancient days. They believed that a man was born under a certain star and his destiny was settled. 
you've had people say, what, uh, what uh, is your, your uh, astrological star? And I, I said, I don't know. And they said, well, when you were born, I said, January 3rd. And they said, oh, you're a Capricorn. And I said, no, I'm a Christian. I don't believe that stuff, but the, the ancients believed it. And Paul is saying that there is nothing in heaven or hell that can do that. Now, the stars were extremely important. Height was a time when a star was at its zenith and its influence was the greatest. You probably heard that. Venus or... Orion is in its zenith. That means that whatever that star proposedly uh, stood for, that was prevalent in the world at that time. And depth was a time when the star was at its lowest, waiting to rise and put its influence on some man. Paul says these haunted men of his age, the stars can't hurt you. In their rising and their setting, they are powerless to separate you from the love of God. Not anything mighty or anything made. For I'm convinced that neither powers nor any other created thing. Now, neither powers. What were the powers? The only power there is, literally, is God. And so what Paul is saying here. God can't separate you from his love, and no created thing, nothing that God made can separate you from his love. Now, I want to tell you, to me, that is blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Well, the third thing I want you to see in this passage of scripture, the super conqueror's certainty. The last part of verse number 39, the last part of Romans chapter 8, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Two things we fear the most, living and dying, are not threats to our eternal life. Whether we live or die, we're in God's love. Things present, things to come, nothing in our present experience, nothing, anything to come can separate us from God's love in Christ. So the question is not, can I lose my salvation? But rather, can God lose me? And it is abundantly clear from Scripture that God knows you, knows where you are, and he will never, ever lose you. Nothing can separate you from his love. Remember all the way back in the Garden of Eden, the serpent tempted Eve and Adam and succeeding in causing them to fall. I mean, they were living, in essence, in eternity already. But then Satan caused them to fall. And what did God say to them? You're going to return to the dust from which you were created. So even though they lost their eternal physical life, God was still not separating them from his love. Satan tempted Adam and Eve to fall, but did not succeed in separating them from the love of God. God still loved Adam and Eve. I remember one of my seminary professors, Bill Hendricks, was uh, always looking for a student to come up with something clever. I remember one time that he drew on the chalkboard a map of the Persian Gulf. And it was at the time when, you know, the, the Iran hostage crisis was going on and all that kind of thing. And uh, he, he said, now, boys and girls, we're going to uh, take the next uh, class period and discuss solutions to this uh, terrible problem in the Persian Gulf. And uh, so he uh, 
the next class, he came into class and he looked on the chalkboard. Somebody had drawn a map of Texas and shoved it up into the Persian Gulf. <laughs> and he looked at it and he, uh, he stroked his chin and he looked around at the class and he said, who put this on the board? And nobody was brave enough to say, I did it. I didn't do it, by the way. Nobody was, was uh, ready to say, I did it. And he, he said, okay, going once, going twice. You sure you don't want to admit this? And the third time, no, 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 it was silent. And he said, it's too bad, boys and girls, because I was going to give whoever drew this map an A for the semester. <laughs> and then he, he did his, his little smile. But uh, the college professors were always doing crazy things. And uh, I, I, he read about one that said, uh, he tells about a, a final in A Course in Logic. And the, the teacher was known for giving unbelievably difficult exams. And to help students complete uh, this final, the professor told them that they could bring as much information to the exam as they could fit on a piece of notebook paper. Now, I've had teachers do that. And I can, I can remember seeing, uh, especially girls, they would write in the smallest possible letters, letters that my nearsighted vision couldn't even see, but they would fill the entire page with information so that they could do this. So most students crammed their facts onto an 11, eight and a half by 11 paper, but one student walked into class with a blank piece of notebook paper and he put it on the floor. But one student, he said, here's how I'm going to use my paper. He invited an upperclassman logic major to come and stand on the paper. <laughs> and so every time that he, he uh, looked at a question, he repeated it to the, the upperclassman. The upperclassman answered, and the student wrote it on the paper and received an A for the course. <laughs> you know, much like this advanced student, Jesus is our intercessor. He is our major in salvation. And he stands ready to help us with his continuous intercession. That's what it says there in Romans, isn't it? That even now he is seated at the right hand of God and he's making constant intercession for you and for me in these days. Give you another thought. Suppose a young woman becomes engaged to a fellow. She knows that he's trustworthy. He'll keep his word to marry her. Does she use this promise as an excuse to go out and be promiscuous, sleep with other men, knowing that her fi fiance will marry her no matter what? Of course not. She loves this young man. His commitment to marry her makes her love him even more. Secure in his love, she wants to please him in everything. Similarly, a Christian life should be led to gratitude and obedience, not waywardness. God has made you a promise and made me a promise. And so we want to remain faithful to him to honor his promise to us. J.F. Packer uh, asked some very convincing questions about this passage of scripture. Question number one, why do I ever grumble and show discontent and resentment at the circumstances in which God has placed me? I think this goes right along with our new study in the book of Jonah. Jonah was a man who complained about everything God did. Number two, 
why am I ever distrustful, fearful, or depressed? Number three, why do I ever allow myself to grow cold, formal, half-hearted in the service of the God who loves me so? Why do I ever allow my loyalties to be divided so that God has not all of my heart? Can an observer learn from the quality and degree of love that I show to others? My wife, husband, family, neighbors, people at church, people at work, anything at all about the greatness of God's love for me? It's a question that we must ponder. Do others see Jesus in us after he has assured us that nothing will separate us from his love, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord? Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you in these moments and we, uh, we are well aware of the fact that oftentimes we fail you, but we come to you right now asking that you would guide us, that you would bless us as we recommit ourselves to you for this coming week, that we might serve you with joy, with confidence, knowing that we're secure in your love and in your power. For we pray this in Jesus' name, for his sake, amen.